Good morning, students. In this video lecture, we are going to learn about categorical syllogisms. A categorical syllogism is a deductive argument in which a conclusion is inferred from two premises. These arguments are obviously based on the relationships between classes, categories. That's why they are called categorical syllogisms. Categorical syllogisms so are deductive arguments that have two premises and a conclusion. That's the definition of a syllogism. Two premises and a conclusion. And um, each of the uh, these uh, three uh, um, statements, two premises and a conclusion, have three, exactly three terms. And these three terms occur twice in the argument. Let me show you what I mean. Let's take this example. No bananas are animals. Some mammals are animals. Therefore, some mammals are not bananas. As you can see, there are two uh, premises and number three is the conclusion. Uh, this is a typical categorical syllogism. Now, it, it, what makes it a categorical syllogism is that all the premises, including the conclusion, are expressed in categorical form. Notice that the first, uh, first premise is a, an E form. No SRP, no bananas are animals. The second premise is an I form, some SRP. And the conclusion is an O form, some S are not P. As I was saying, categorical syllogism. Now, when I talk about a categorical syllogism in this lecture, I'm, I'm referring to... Uh, uh, a mouthful that I, I don't want to say every time, but, but I'm referring to a standard form categorical syllogism. Okay, so when I say categorical syllogism, I mean a standard form categorical syllogism. As I mentioned earlier, a standard form categorical syllogism has three terms, and these three terms occur exactly twice in the argument. Notice, for example, the first term is bananas. So we have bananas once and bananas twice. The second term is animals, once and twice. And the third term is mammals and mammals. So as you can see, uh, a standard form categorical syllogism has three terms and these three terms occur twice. If it has more than three terms, then it's not a standard form categorical syllogism. I don't know what that is. So we can uh, uh, put it this way. A standard form categorical syllogism is in standard form if it satisfies these requirements. The first requirement is that as I said, its premises are, and its conclusion are expressed in a categorical form, which means the, uh, the premises and the conclusion must be either an A form, an E form, an I form, or an O form. The second requirement is that there are exactly three different terms. No more than three, no fewer than three. The third requirement is that each term occurs twice. The fourth requirement is that the major premise is always stated first. So our first premise in a categorical syllogism, in a standard form, always comes first. Always is premise one. Now, some of you might say, 
duh, of course the first premise comes first. Well, that's not that's not necessarily the case. In uh, some arguments, the uh, the first premise might not be the first premise. In fact, um, many arguments that we have seen in my examples in the, in our lectures, um, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, in those examples, the uh, the conclusion came first. But in a standard form categorical syllogism, the first premise always comes first. And, uh, and we call that the major premise. The minor premise is always the second one. And then there is the conclusion. Now, why do we call it the major and the minor premise? Um, I'm going to explain this in a, in a second, but let me uh, first uh, explain the, uh, the fifth requirement of a standard form categorical syllogism, which is that the middle term never occurs in the conclusion. And once again, why do we call the middle term? What is the minor term? What is the major term? What is the major premise and so on? I'm going to explain that in a second. So. Uh, the minor, the major, and the middle term. What are they? As I said, the uh, the major premise it comes first. The the, uh, the minor premise uh, is the second premise, and then there is the conclusion. Why do we call them major and minor? Because they contain uh, the major premise contains the major term, and the minor premise obviously the minor term. But what about the middle term? You might think, oh, well, then the conclusion contains the, the middle term. No, I just said the fifth requirement. Remember, the middle term never occurs in the conclusion. The middle term, in fact, is the term that doesn't occur in the conclusion. As you can see in this example, in the conclusion, we have, we have babies and we have trees. Which is the... Uh, the, the, the term that doesn't occur in a conclusion. That would be humans. So the first premise is no trees are humans, some babies are humans, and therefore some babies are not trees. Now, how do we uh, identify the major and the minor term? That's very simple. If a syllogism is in standard form, you, uh, you have to look at the conclusion. The conclusion in the previous example is some babies are not trees. Now notice that babies is the, uh, the subject term and trees is the uh, predicate term. So we look at the conclusion, we identify the predicate term of the conclusion and the predicate term of the conclusion is going to be our major term. Okay, so uh, it might seem uh, uh, counterintuitive. You might think the subject comes first, so it, it is the major. No, it's the other way around. The, uh, uh, the predicate term is the major term, and the subject term is the minor term. So naturally, the middle term is the, uh, the only term that does not occur in a conclusion, is the one that is left. So, uh, as I said, the premise containing the major term, that's why we call it the major premise, and the minor, we call it the minor premise. Okay, now let me talk about a different topic. Since we are, we are dealing with uh, standard form categorical syllogisms, we have to be very precise with, with syllogisms. And to be precise, we have to describe a syllogism. So one way to describe a syllogism is to, uh, uh, to describe it by, by its mood. Yes, syllogisms are, have a mood. They're moody. What is the mood? The mood 
of a syllogism is determined by the uh, the letters. The letters representing the uh, the, uh, the the categorical statement. So, uh, since there are three statements in a categorical syllogism, and and each statement must be expressed in categorical form. Uh, the three letters of the categorical forms uh, representing the, uh, the premises constitute the mood. For example, let's take the uh, previous example. No trees are humans. That is an E form. So we write E. Second premise, some babies are humans. That's an I. And the conclusion, some babies are not trees, is an O form. So we say that the mood of this particular syllogism is an E, I, O. But the mood is not sufficient to, um, to describe, precisely describe the, uh, the categorical syllogism. So uh, the last thing that we need to be precise is to, uh, to say which figure the categorical syllogism is. So we need the mood and the figure. That's what describes completely a uh, categorical syllogism. Now let me explain what the, uh, the figure is by <clears throat> giving you two examples. Notice the, uh, these two uh, arguments, A and B these two syllogisms. The e example A says, all scientists are college graduates. Some athletes are college graduates. Therefore, some athletes are scientists. Now think about this for a moment. And let's read uh, B now. All artists are egoists. Some artists are Americans. Consequently, some Americans are egoists. Notice that both arguments have the same mood. Namely, they are AII. -I. However, they have different figures. In fact, if you notice, syllogism A is invalid. Syllogism B is valid. So we know from this that the mood does not tell us whether the, uh, the syllogism is valid or invalid. It's going to be something else that tells us that. And that is the figure. Notice that our first uh, um, example A, syllogism A, has a certain figure. The middle term occurs, as you can see, as the uh, predicate term in the major premise and also as a major, as a predicate term in the minor premise. On the other hand, notice what happens here in syllogism B. In syllogism B, the middle term now is somewhere else. It occurs as the uh, subject term of the major and the subject term of the minor. Okay, so that's what the, the, uh, the figure is. The figure is the uh, position of the middle term in a syllogism. There are four figures, four possibilities, four combinations. Let me list one by one and explain. In the first figure, notice this is, this is our syllogism. So this is our major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. <coughs> <coughs> so in the first uh, figure, we have the middle term occurring as the subject term of the major premise 
and the predicate term of the minor premise. So it goes from uh, um, upper left corner to uh, uh, bottom right. Now, by the way, I I didn't just wake up this morning and decided that these are the figures. These are the figures. Okay, they're not arbitrary. All logicians in the world, in Japan, in China, in Africa, in Italy, uh, they all know that these are the four figures. So figure one is the figure one. Figure two, for figure two, notice that the middle term moves both middle terms. Uh, I mean, both middle terms, it's one middle term, but uh, in, in both premises, uh, the middle term moves all the way to the right. So now for figure two, the middle term occurs as the, uh, the predicate term of the major and the predicate term of the minor. Now take a, a second to uh, look at this argument, this syllogism, and tell me what do you see that looks strange. Isn't this what looks strange? At least for, for uh, many students, uh, the first time that they see this, they, uh, they wonder, wait a minute, how come the, uh, the predicate is here? Isn't this the subject? See, you notice in the, in the major, major premise, we have P. Well, naturally, we don't mean uh, the subject of, of the major premise. What we mean is, remember, this is the major term. And the major term, we learned that the major term is the, uh, the predicate term of the conclusion. So this is what this is. This is why we label it P. So uh, the major major term is the predicate term of the conclusion. Okay, so the subject term of the major premise is the uh, predicate term of the conclusion. That's why we label it P. Figure three. In figure three, Remember, figure two, we have the middle term all the way to the right. And for figure three, now we're moving all the way back to the left, okay? Where the middle term occurs as the subject of both major and minor premise. Notice once again, what I said, what I just said a minute ago, um, this in a, you notice the, uh, the second premise, the minor premise. Um, in the place of the, the predicate, we have S, uh, which is a subject, but it's, it's the subject of the conclusion, remember? Okay, what about figure four? Figure four, if you notice, figure four is the mirror image of, um, or it's the negative image of figure one. See, figure one goes from top left to bottom right, and uh, figure four from top right to bottom left. Okay, so uh, you have to remember the, uh, the four figures. I always say to my students, uh, don't try to remember things. It's better if you uh, think about the concept, and the concept itself will... Uh, will serve you as uh, a reminder. In this case, I have to say, you have to remember. There, there's no other, there, there's no, I don't think that there's a, um, a, a principle that you can, uh, uh, you can think about. It, you just have to remember. So now let me give you a, a, um, uh, a, a trick, a technique to remember the four figures. Um, Let's say that you're taking an exam and you don't remember the four figures. You can think about this and you'll always remember. Now, let me uh, go back and, and show you uh, number one. So figure number one, as I said, goes from top left to bottom right. Figure number two, um, it's a vertical all the way to the right. 
figure three forms another vertical all the way to the left. And figure four, a uh, diagonal from left to uh, bottom left to, uh, to top right. When you, uh, you take your, uh, your four forms, these four forms, and you, uh, <clears throat> and you list them one next to, it, to another, okay? You can uh, actually notice a, uh, an interesting pattern. And the interesting pattern is a, that they form a W. Look, look at my cursor. It, it forms a, a one, two, three, and four, okay? So it forms a W. This is one V and that's another V, okay? In other words, it forms this pattern. This is number one. What you have to remember, however, is that number two, number two is going to be this, going to be all the way to the right. For number three, you go back to the left. And, uh, and you form a W, okay? And number four, just the opposite. So to, to, to really form a W, um, see, um, that's it. Okay, so um, let's go back to uh, an example. Um, for example, no heroes are cowards, some soldiers are cowards. And therefore, some soldiers are not heroes. Okay, so uh, to uh, fully describe this syllogism, we say that it's a, an, an E-I-O-2. Why two? Because remember, the, uh, the middle term, okay, this will be number one, this will be number two. And then three is going to be here. Since the, the middle term of cowards is, occurs as the predicate term in the major and the minor, we have figure number two, remember? This is one, and this is two. Okay, so we have an E-I-O-2. In the exam, I, I will give you a, a syllogism and a, nothing easier than this. And you identify the, uh, the mood and the figure. Nothing easier. You just, the, the mood is automatic if you are, obviously you have to, you have to know the categorical forms. Once you, you know the categorical forms, you know the mood of a syllogism. And then the other uh, figure, you have to remember. Now, if you, again, if you forget, just remember, W. But remember that the W, so uh, you, uh, you go this way first, diagonal from top left to bottom right, and then you have to move all the way to the right, and uh, you go down like this, that's going to be number two, figure two. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the predicate terms, both predicate terms of major and minor, number two, then you move all the way to the left. So the middle term is going to be the subject of the, uh, the major and the minor, and finally, number four, you have uh, this diagonal that goes from bottom left to top right. Okay, so we have subject, I mean, predicate of the major and subject of the minor. Okay, if we list all the categorical syllogisms by mood, we start at A, A, A. A-A-E, A-A-I, A-A-O, okay? Um, all the way to uh, O-O-O, we will have listed 64 different moods. And since there are four figures, 64 times four is 256 possibilities, 256 different syllogisms. Okay, now 
the uh, the last um, the very last uh, slides of my presentation are some exercises. So uh, practice. There there are also uh, exercises on your textbook. Practice. Take a syllogism. Take a syllogism. Like one, two, three, four. I have different ones. I can. Um, show you the slide, you can pause the video if you want to use the video. Um, what you do is you, uh, you read the other syllogism and you reconstruct it. Notice that I, I purposely jumble it up so uh, the, uh, the, it's not in the correct order. You're going to have to uh, identify the conclusion and from the conclusion you will have to uh, reconstruct second premise and first premise uh, that's very easy. Once you uh, you uh, you have identified the conclusion, then you uh, you uh, you see the uh, the predicate term. That's going to be the uh, the major term, and you know that the major term is the one contained in uh, in the major premise. So that's going to be premise number one, because the the, uh, the predicate term of the conclusion of your syllogism is not going to uh, occur anywhere else, but only. In obviously in the conclusion and in the first premise, in the major premise. So you know that that's the major premise. The second one is going to be the minor premise. Once you have done that, you reconstructed the, uh, the syllogism, then all you have to do is to uh, find the mood and find the figure. That's a very simple exercise. So try it. Uh, I have six exercises here on, uh, on my PowerPoint, uh, but there are many, many more on your textbook. Okay, uh, this is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you uh, uh, next lecture. Bye bye.